This is AMTV. Hello there everyone, and welcome to part 25 of this series looking at the history and impact of Doctor Who viewing figures. If you're joining us for the first time, a very warm welcome to you. We hope you stick around for future instalments and check out our previous episodes. We've covered the first six Doctor's eras and the first year of the seventh Doctor, but for now, sit back, relax, and join me once again as we delve back into the wonderfully niche world of Doctor Who viewing figures. Our destination? Season 25. The year is 1988, and Doctor Who had entered its 25th anniversary year. The last few seasons have proved to be quite a tumultuous time for the programme. After the extended hiatus in 1985, the Rocky Trial Saga of 1986, and the low ratings of 1987, all were casting a cloud of doom and gloom for the Time Lord and his adventures. However, Season 25 had been confirmed early into the Seventh Doctor's run, and given that it marked the programme's silver anniversary, the expectation amongst fans was that all of the stops would be pulled out to mark the occasion, just as it had been for the show's 10th and 20th birthdays. Despite having orchestrated the commercial success that was the 20th anniversary in 1983, producer John Nathan Turner arguably had a bigger task on his hands this time around. Doctor Who's profile amongst the general viewing public had weakened considerably over the last few years, but that wouldn't stop JNT and his team from attempting to celebrate the show's Silver Jubilee in style. Four new stories were lined up for the season, stories that would feature a mix of returning foes and thrilling new villains to go up against the TARDIS team. The team itself would consist of Sylvester McCoy, returning for his second run of adventures as the Seventh Doctor, and Sophie Aldred as his brand new companion, Ace. And it's arguably here in which we really begin to delve into and explore these characters. Gone is the overly comedic tendencies from season 24, with the Doctor now casting a more mysterious, almost unnerving presence, executing long-held plans all whilst keeping his cards very close to his chest. With Ace, her journey is just beginning, but already in these four stories, we see that she is far more than just another typical companion of the classic series. But even with all of this, even with the promise of returning favourites, even with the exploration of a darker, more mysterious Doctor, would the viewing figures hold up? Would audiences flock back to help celebrate Doctor Who's 25th anniversary, or would the numbers remain low, or even worse, continue to sink to lower depths than ever before? Let's delve right into Season 25 and find out. The first story from Season 25 is Remembrance of the Daleks. Planet Earth, 1963. The Doctor and Ace are caught in the crossfire between two rival Dalek factions searching for the Hand of Omega. The Doctor has a plan, but can he stay one step ahead of his oldest enemies? This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 5th of October, 1988, and concluded on the 26th of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and this is a noticeable improvement over the previous season. Granted, the numbers are still quite low for 1988 standards, but considering that season 24 struggled to maintain 5 million viewers, to see all four episodes of Remembrance hold within that bracket is reassuring to say the least. Part 1 kicks things off with 5.5 million, matching the most viewed episode from the previous year, and for Part 2 the following week, a few hundred thousand more have joined the proceedings, with 5.8 million tuning in to see whether the Doctor was able to escape the hovering Dalek. Part 3 unfortunately drops down to 5.1 million, and Part 4 further still to bang on 5 million, but again, I'm happy to see that for the opening story of the 25th anniversary year, public interest seems to have been pipped somewhat, even if it's only just a slight spike in viewership. For the top 40 TV programmes, Doctor Who sadly wasn't able to triumphantly return to the charts, but all four episodes managed to gain a foothold within the top 100. Parts 1 and 2 draw for peak position, both finishing at 78th place, whilst parts 3 and 4 come dangerously close to triple digits, with part 3 clocking in at 91st and part 4 at 96th. A spot in the top 100 is an achievement, but when you can't crack at least 6 million, the chances of Doctor Who ever returning to settle within the top 40 grow thinner and thinner by the year. With throwbacks to the past, a proper first story for Ace, and the return of some shiny new Daleks, why weren't the viewing figures for Remembrance skyrocketing through the roof? Well, as is fast becoming traditional at this point, Doctor Who was once again moved around in the television schedules in the lead-up to Season 25 starting transmission. The previous year had seen the TARDIS team absolutely obliterated by ITV's Coronation Street, which was routinely bringing in double, if not triple, the viewership that was tuning into BBC One. Doctor Who was moved away from Monday nights, now resting midweek on Wednesdays. However, the time slot of the show, around 7.35pm, was retained, which meant that once again, the Time Lord would be battling the cast of the Cobbles over on Corrie. This decision lends to the theory that higher-ups at the BBC were slowly trying to kill off Doctor Who, 
by placing it against such immeasurable odds in terms of its competition. And in terms of how long it was able to do that for, we'll talk more on that when we get there. One shift that had happened late in the day was the premiere date for season 25. Originally having been scheduled to begin on Wednesday the 7th of September, due to the extensive coverage of the 1988 Olympic Games in Seoul, South Korea, numerous changes had to be made by UK broadcasters in order to accommodate this. As a result, Doctor Who was pushed back by four weeks, with Remembrance now beginning on the 5th of October. But even if season 25 was pushed back, this arguably gave the BBC more time to actively market and promote the programme, certainly if not to celebrate the 25th anniversary year at the very least. The leading element of these celebrations was the release of a special trailer to promote the Silver Anniversary series. These featured several clips from season 25 stories, including Remembrance, The Greatest Show in the Galaxy, and Silver Nemesis. This trailer also featured some special linking material featuring the Doctor and Ace, and was first seen by the press back in August, and later by the public some months later. As well as the series trailer, Sylvester McCoy made numerous appearances on a variety of programmes. These included spots on Breakfast Time, The Clothes Show, and Noel Edmonds' Saturday Roadshow, in which McCoy appeared in character as the Doctor on the Clown Court segment, providing skits between screenings of various outtakes from filming the programme. Furthermore, Sylvester had been booked to be the narrator and frontman of a brand new live show aimed at children, What's Your Story? This programme built on the choose-your-own-adventure style of storytelling that was somewhat popular in the 1980s, and allowed viewers the unique chance to phone up and help dictate where the story went next. So with the then-current Doctor Who fronting this exciting new programme, plus his numerous guest appearances on shows aimed at a wide range of audiences, it's arguable to suggest that Doctor Who's profile amongst the casual viewer base was quite healthy. But it wasn't just the Doctor that was the subject of Season 25's initial promotion, but also the return of his deadliest enemies, the Daleks. The Pepper Pots may not have been seen too much on other programmes, but publications such as the Radio Times gave them some decent coverage in the run-up to Remembrance's transmission. Most of the press were a bit kinder to the season opener this time around, praising the impressive storytelling and the return of the Daleks, though not everyone was so kind. Two days after Part 1, comments on the serial were featured on opinion-based programme Open Air, in which a variety of comments, both positive and negative, were shared. But Doctor Who was back, with his deadliest enemies leading the charge, and with their popularity still as present as ever, it could be argued that the presence of the Daleks helped the programme receive the little boost in viewership that we see with Remembrance. It may have been outdone threefold by Coronation Street's regular audience of around 15 million, but we have to take the small victories where we can. It is a shame that the programme's viewing figures aren't higher, as Remembrance of the Daleks is not only one of the best stories of the Sylvester McCoy years, but also one of the best Doctor Who stories ever told. It serves as another turning point for the show, one in which the excessive frivolity of the previous year is stripped away, and in its place are some genuinely great moments of character drama, excellent action sequences featuring armies of Daleks, and some wonderful moments for the Seventh Doctor. Moments in which the Master Manipulator begins to show his true power. Moments in which the mystique that McCoy and script editor Andrew Cartmel longed to put back into the programme was beginning to shine through. The writer of this adventure, Ben Aronovich, was new to the writing team, but a Doctor Who fan at heart. And not only does he write the Daleks fantastically, but he's able to portray the leads with a huge degree of depth, depth that arguably is sometimes not so present in certain classic Who stories. But not only is this story a triumph for the Doctor, but his new companion Ace also gets some great scenes to showcase her personality and just how different and unique of a companion she was going to be for the program. Her strong views on certain antiquated values of the 1960s go a long way to influence how the show would portray similar stories in the 21st century, and her hands-on approach, particularly with fighting Daleks, is certainly a highlight too. Talking of Daleks, we get treated to two factions of them this time around. The familiar grey-looking machines with their black and silver supreme are the renegade faction, whilst the white and gold-plated Daleks returned from the previous outing three years earlier, now slightly modified to what has got to be one of my favourite Dalek designs of all time. These are denoted as the Imperial Daleks, led by a spherical emperor, who is later revealed to be the Dalek creator, Davros. Whilst his presence and influence in the serial remain quite minimal, it's great to see Terry Malloy reprise the role as the malevolent megalomaniac one last time in the classic series. The Dalek action sequences, as mentioned, are excellent, and despite the limited budget, go a long way to make these moments feel exciting and thrilling for those who tune in. And speaking of set pieces, this story marked the very first time that viewers saw a Dalek levitate up a flight of stairs, putting to rest 25 years worth of tired jokes and also arguably giving us one of the show's most surprising and tantalising cliffhangers. Overall, this story attracted an average of 5.4 million viewers, a 0.3 increase from the previous story, Season 24's Dragonfire. 
Whilst it's great to see Doctor Who's viewership increase for the beginning of this new run of adventures, 5.4 million is still leagues away from the numbers that the programme was able to pull in even just a couple of years ago. And even with the popular appeal of the Daleks, for Remembrance to pull in fewer than 6 million viewers is really quite staggering, but perhaps not surprising given what it was up against. Regardless though of how little a splash this serial may have made back in 1988, it didn't take long for fans old and new to sink their teeth into it, and celebrate it for its stellar writing, great supporting characters, and its memorable moments. To experience all of the madness for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1990 or its audio adaptation from 2015. To watch it, it was released with The Chase on VHS as part of a limited edition Dalek tin set in 1993 and later as part of the Davros box set from 2001, which was exclusive to WH Smith's and also contained the other classic Who stories featuring the Dalek creator. That same year, the story made its way to DVD as a standalone release and was later re-released several times, first as part of WH Smith's exclusive Dalek Collector's Edition set and a remastered version appeared on the 2007 Complete Davros Collection, which had a limited print run of copies available. Remembrance also got a special edition 2 disc release on DVD in 2009, correcting past mistakes and adding a whole bunch of new extras. Remembrance of the Daleks still is a great example of the high quality of storytelling Doctor Who can achieve regardless of what any outside factors are placed before it. Lots of Dalek action, lots of great moments for the two leads, a supporting cast who are absolutely wonderful and went on to have their own series of adventures on audio by the way. Just every ingredient thrown into Remembrance, in my view at least, works flawlessly. This is more than just a positive recommendation. I would argue that this is an absolute must watch for anyone who wants to delve into Doctor Who. Period. You will be The second story from Season 25 is The Happiness Patrol. The Doctor has heard of something evil on the planet Terra Alpha, and tonight's the night. Dictator Helen A has outlawed sadness, enforcing her rule of law with The Happiness Patrol. Smile or die, the choice is yours. This story is comprised of three episodes, which began airing on the 2nd of November, 1988, and concluded on the 16th of the same month. Here are the individual viewing figures for all three episodes, and the numbers seem to be slipping slightly. Two thirds of the adventure were able to attract over 5 million viewers, with both parts 1 and 3 drawing in 5.3 million. However, part 2 takes us below the 5 million mark for the first time this season, with 4.6 million tuning in to see the events happening on Terra Alpha. Keep in mind, hovering below or above 5 million was still not the best showing for a program in 1988, especially one that had been on the air for 25 years and had a wide international appeal too. But what about the top 40 programs? Well, for the first time since 1985, Doctor Who fell below the top 100, with part 2 charting at 104th place. Parts 1 and 3 managed to grab a spot however, coming in at 96th and 88th respectively. If low viewing figures weren't already ringing alarm bells, falling out of the top 100 programs for the week would have only made those bells louder. Still, it was just for one of the Happiness Patrol's three weeks on air, and hopefully we won't see it reoccur for the remainder of season 25. What happened here then? After such a strong season opener, why weren't more audience members tuning into BBC One to see the Doctor and Ace go up against Helen A and her subordinates? I think we can all cite the primary answer to this question would once again be the competition over at ITV. With Wednesday's Coronation Street still airing directly against Doctor Who, more than triple the audiences were tuning in to see the drama on the cobbles instead of the Doctor's exploits on Terra Alpha. Just to acknowledge VCRs, by 1988 VHS was clearly the dominant format of choice for home recording, and whilst more viewers were recording programmes, Doctor Who included, these recorded playbacks weren't considered for the ratings charts, with only live viewers being considered. Promotional efforts around the time of the Happiness Patrol's broadcast, however, was a different story, as Sylvester McCoy in particular was still popping up everywhere on TV. Two days after Remembrance of the Daleks concluded, McCoy, together with Sophie Aldred and former Dr. John Pertwee, appeared on Daytime Live to chat about and celebrate the 25th anniversary. Sylvester would return to the program just days later on the 1st of November in order to help promote his new BBC One children's show, What's Your Story? Running for four consecutive days over a fortnight period, McCoy served as host and narrator to the various stories the nation's children submitted, with over a million of them calling in, usually suggesting stories of a time travel nature. As if all of this coverage wasn't enough, McCoy would make an appearance on Saturday morning children's show, Going Live, between parts one and two of The Happiness Patrol on the 5th of November. Broadcasting live from Centre Parks in Nottingham, Sylvester in costume as the Doctor again promoted both Doctor Who as well as What's Your Story. Print coverage for the programme at this time was fairly minuscule in comparison to all of these TV appearances, 
However, all of that would change between parts 2 and 3, when the production team would face the wrath of Bertie Bassett. You see, this is the Candyman. I don't think it's too unreasonable to claim that he bears some design similarities to this gentleman, Bertie Bassett. Clearly the chairman of the confectionery group, HB or Bev Stokes, found this one step too far, and on Thursday the 10th of November, submitted a letter to producer John Nathan Turner, claiming that Bertie Bassett was being used in Doctor Who as an evil killer in the form of the Candyman. To bolster his arguments, Stokes claimed that he believed this villain would cause confusion in the minds of the public and could have a negative effect on the sale of our products. Stokes requested that a disclaimer be placed onto the remaining episode and that the Candyman character never be used again. The press picked up on all of this drama pretty quickly, and soon enough the sensationalist headlines would hit shop shelves, perhaps contributing to the 0.7 million boost in viewership for part 3? But that's just a theory of course. Towards the end of November, BBC Copyright officially refuted the charges, citing no connection. However, they did reassure Bassett that the Candyman would never be used again, and sure enough, over 30 years since his original appearance, he has not graced our TV screens on Doctor Who ever again. Despite the drama over the Candyman, The Happiness Patrol is quite frankly one of the most underrated adventures of the McCoy era. The world of Terra Alpha, despite the happy facade, is deliciously grim in tone, and the various inhabitants within it, whether it's Helen A's group of female mercenaries or those who resist her, the world feels lived in and quite detailed as a result. The author of the serial, Graham Curry, was another new face in the Doctor Who production team, and although he never contributed a script to the programme again, I feel for a first attempt The Happiness Patrol holds some pretty strong stuff, and even though he was and still is to some degree the subject of ridicule, I actually find the Candyman to be quite a unique villain in Doctor Who's long lineup of enemies. A vicious mind with a killer sense of what it means to feel pleasure, the almost wailing voice, and the distinct design all contribute to him being a memorable villain, and it's a shame that the BBC bowed to Bassett's, probably preventing him from ever being seen on screen again. However, I think the real shining factor of this story is Sheila Hancock's portrayal of Helen A, the head of the Happiness Patrol, who's determined to ensure that happiness will prevail. Her take on the character has allusions to the current Prime Minister of the day, Margaret Thatcher, and indeed, numerous elements of the serial could be cited as a pseudo-statement on the Conservative government of the day. Her downfall is extremely well handled, and also once again shows off how phenomenal of an actor Sylvester McCoy is. Similar to Remembrance, there are little moments littered throughout the Happiness Patrol that really showcase just how different his Doctor is. One highlight is the scene with the two snipers, where the Doctor is able to manipulate them for his own ends, and a scene towards the end, in which the Time Lord confronts a devastated Helen A. These scenes are some of the best classic Who has to offer, so I highly recommend that you check those out at the very least, but to be honest, I'd recommend The Happiness Patrol in its entirety. You'll be treated to three episodes of some unique settings, some unique villains, and some interesting questions asked, the kind that are present in any high-quality drama. But as you watch it, perhaps go easy on the sweet treats. Overall, this story attracted an average of 5.1 million viewers, a 0.3 decrease from the previous story. A decline is never a nice thing to see, but at least it isn't a colossal one. After the hype of the Daleks returning, it seems that a great many of those viewers were willing to stick around, and I'm sure the drama from the Bassett's complaints could have helped at least raise the series' profile once again. But considering this is the 25th anniversary year, to see Doctor Who reduced to pulling in barely over 5 million viewers is a little crushing to say the least. The Happiness Patrol may have elements that may be considered laughable, but if you strip that away, you really do have quite an eerie adventure. Whether it's the inhabitants of Terra Alpha, how Helen A enforces the Happiness Patrol's efforts, the malicious tendencies of the Candyman, in just three episodes, there's plenty to enjoy and soak up. To enjoy your very own fondant surprise, you can read the Target book from 1990, or its audio adaptation from 2009. To watch it, you have the standalone VHS release from 1997, or on DVD as part of the Ace Adventures box set, which also included Dragonfire and was released in 2012. Despite being ridiculed and mocked for years, it is reassuring to see that in recent times, the Happiness Patrol has gained a new appreciation amongst audiences. The running themes of happiness, the suppression of sadness, the political undertones of the late 80s, whether it's from an analytical or recreational point of view, the Happiness Patrol, I believe, continued to mark the progressive change that the lead actor and script editor wanted for the programme. A dive into darker subjects, with a much darker doctor right at the centre of the action. Check it out for yourself, and remember, happiness will prevail. Do it then. Look me in the eye. Pull the trigger. End my life. The third and penultimate story from season 25 is Silver Nemesis. An ancient Time Lord weapon crashes to Earth, drawing the Doctor and Ace into a battle with Cybermen, neo Nazis, and the sinister Lady Painfort. 
Can the Doctor keep his darkest of secrets? Doctor Who? This story is comprised of three episodes, which began airing on the 23rd of November, 1988, and concluded on the 7th of December. Here are the individual viewing figures for all three episodes, and this is what I call an improvement. For the first time since Revelation of the Daleks back in 1985, Doctor Who was finally able to crack the 6 million mark, with 6.1 million joining the TARDIS team on the anniversary night broadcast. However, it is a shame to see that the audience boost didn't hold, with parts 2 and 3 losing nearly a million viewers, both drawing in 5.2 million instead. Great to see that Silver Nemesis never slipped below the 5 million mark, but after starting strong with over 6 million, the fact that audiences weren't convinced to carry on with the adventure is a little disheartening, especially as this was technically the 25th anniversary story. For the top 40 TV programmes, Doctor Who was able to avoid slipping below the top 100, though parts 2 and 3 came close, charting at 94th and 98th place respectively. Part 1 leaps above them by quite a margin, managing to settle itself at 76th on the chart. We've got one more story after this, so let's hope that spots within the top 100 are waiting for it. But where did it all go wrong here? A story featuring one of the Doctor's most popular adversaries going out on the show's actual 25th birthday? 6 million viewers is nice, but why weren't there many more millions tuning in? Once again, Coronation Street was a huge factor in preventing Silver Nemesis from gaining a much higher viewership. You think just over 6 million is a good figure for late 80s Who? Well, the ITV soap was pulling in over 19 million viewers around the same time, way more than three times the amount of viewers watching the Doctor battle the Cybermen. But by this point, the production team knew the almost impossible competition that they faced, and thankfully, Silver Nemesis received arguably the greatest amount of promotional coverage across all of Season 25. Given that this was quite literally the Silver Jubilee adventure, Part 1 was screened at a special celebratory event at the 3001 Space Adventure Tourist Attraction in London on the 15th of November in which Sylvester McCoy, Sophie Aldred, John Nathan Turner, director Chris Clough and composer Kef McCulloch were all in attendance. At this event, numerous interviews were recorded for other programmes, including Hearts of Gold, Behind the Screen and Open Air. Speaking of Open Air, as well as the pre-recorded interviews, appearing in studio to discuss the programme's longevity were former Doctor Who John Pertwee and the show's original producer, Verity Lambert. However, Doctor Who was a focus on Open Air just a few weeks later, as two days after Part 1 on the 25th of November, some complained of the scenes featuring Lady Painfort shooting arrows at pigeons, to which the BBC production office issued a statement reassuring viewers that no birds were hurt in the making of the programme. But whilst all of this 25th anniversary coverage was a great boost for the show, one rather unique slice of promotion would come from the United States. Filmed on location during the filming of Silver Nemesis, the making of Doctor Who was a documentary focusing on the series, aimed at the rapidly expanding American fanbase. Premiering in New Jersey on the 19th of November, John Nathan Turner, who was in attendance, had requested that the documentary be shown on the BBC, but had his request turned down, on the basis that the Beeb found the special to be… too American. At the time of this video, its only official release here in the UK was via the Silver Nemesis VHS from 1993. One interesting note is that the theme for the documentary was Doctor in the TARDIS, which was recorded by the Time Lords, later to be known as the KLF, and this tune was released in the June of 1988 and is essentially a club remix of the Doctor Who theme and as such, it reached number one on the UK singles chart. That's right, a remix of the theme tune became a number one single. Funny how things work out. To top all of this off, Silver Nemesis received a trailer that was aired extensively on BBC One. Using clips from the serial alongside a classic scene from The Web Planet, this trailer aimed to show how far Doctor Who had come in the last quarter century, and together with the extensive promotion on TV, could have helped push those audience numbers over the 6 million mark for part one. In the print world, the coverage was just as extensive. The Radio Times dedicated a four-page colour article to the series, with focus on the various companions over the years, while Sylvester became the first subject interviewed for the brand new My Kind of Day segment of the Listings magazine. On the day of Part 1's broadcast, the anniversary date of the 23rd of November, many publications ran articles celebrating the milestone. The reaction to Silver Nemesis in the press was quite mixed, although a BBC audience research study showed that this story was the most popular of the season. Whether you love it or loathe it, it's abundantly clear that Silver Nemesis was made to be the pseudo 25th anniversary special. Its first episode air date of the 23rd of November was no coincidence, as Silver Nemesis was originally intended to be the final story of season 25, however the delayed launch due to the Olympics coverage meant that the serial would have to go out second to last if it wished to keep that November 23rd air date. Lots of elements are thrown into the story, the return of the Cybermen being the main highlight. I always found it nice how they chose the Cybermen over the Daleks for the anniversary story, cementing just how important the metal monsters are to the world of Doctor Who. It may not be their strongest outing, but their presence is welcome nonetheless, along with their chrome-plated redesign. 
The other villains vying for the power of the Nemesis are a group of neo-Nazis, led by renowned actor Anton Diffring, and 17th century characters Lady Painfort and her companion Richard. The extensive location work too looks fantastic, and many of the action sequences, like Remembrance, look wonderful. There's lots of nice oddities within Silver Nemesis, many of them being cameo appearances. You have jazz musician Courtney Pine at the top of the story, stage star Dolores Grey in Part 3, a Queen Elizabeth II look-alike, as well as several tourists of Windsor Castle being people who had an association with the programme, including Brigadier actor Nicholas Courtney, directors Andrew Morgan, Fiona Cumming and Peter Moffat, and writers Graham Curry and Kevin Clark. Speaking of the latter, Kevin Clark was the third and final new writer to season 25, and for your first script to be penciled as the 25th anniversary story, that must have been no easy feat to tackle. Despite some of his initial ideas being toned down, Clark's script is able to communicate more mystery surrounding the Doctor, continuing the trend we saw in Remembrance of the Daleks and the Happiness Patrol. The final confrontation, between the TARDIS team, the Cybermen and Lady Painfort, offers us a tantalising tease, with the 17th century villain claiming she knows exactly who the Doctor is, threatening to reveal his secrets. And sure, this theme of the Doctor's identity isn't the central focus throughout the story, but these teases and glimpses really do have a weight to them, and help build up this image of the master manipulator and a being of a higher power that the production team wanted to develop. It may have had a lot of silly moments, and as mentioned, it doesn't necessarily show the Cybermen off at their strongest, but if anything, Silver Nemesis is a lot of fun, and if your anniversary special should be anything, at its core, it should be fun. Overall, this story attracted an average of 5.5 million viewers, a 0.4 increase from the previous story. It's great to see the averages rise up, especially in time for the 25th anniversary story, but when compared to the 10th and 20th anniversary adventures, Silver Nemesis doesn't hold a candle to them in terms of the ratings. However, despite the insane strength of the competition, and with a good bout of promotion, for Silver Nemesis to finish with the audience it did, is a victory I'm willing to take. It may not be the best anniversary story, it may not be a favourite to many, but if there's one thing I enjoy about this serial that's concurrent with the rest of season 25, it's the feeling of how fresh the experience is. Doctor Who around this time feels like it has a new lease of life, that it's enjoying every moment of, and as a result, you get an adventure that may feel a little lacking in some places, but never is a bore to sit through. To see just who wins control over the Nemesis statue for yourself, you can read the Target book, from 1989, but there's no audio adaptation as of yet. To watch it, you have the 1993 VHS release, which included 11 minutes of previously untransmitted material, and the documentary, The Making of Doctor Who, which had previously been broadcast in North America, and at the time of making this video, still hasn't been included on any future releases of this story. You can also enjoy Silver Nemesis on DVD, bundled together with Revenge of the Cybermen, as part of a twin release box set from 2010. As 25th anniversary stories go, Silver Nemesis may seem a little unconventional, but I admire it all the more for that. It doesn't feel the need to gather multiple Doctors or companions, instead it focuses on telling an interesting story, featuring one of the Doctor's greatest enemies, alongside new foes who have their own impact too. What's more, these mysterious ramifications of just who the Doctor really is would continue to be developed in both this era and the generations to come. But of course, more on that when we get there. Have you never wondered where he came from? Who he is? Nobody knows who the Doctor is. Except me. The fourth and final story from season 25 is the greatest show in the galaxy. Roll up, roll up. The psychic circus has come to Saganax, and it needs acts to keep the audience entertained. The Doctor and Ace are among a weird troop of performers in the ring, where something sinister waits. This story is comprised of four episodes, which began airing on the 14th of December 1988, and concluded on the 4th of January 1989. Here are the individual viewing figures for all four episodes, and talk about a sporadic way to finish. Parts 1 and 2 carry on the consistency that we've seen for most of season 25, with the instalments bringing in 5 and 5.3 million respectively. For part 3, things take a rather unfortunate dip down, with just 4.8 million watching the Doctor face the clowns of the psychic circus. In a dramatic turn of events, however, part 4 manages to not only soar above 6 million, but also attains the honour of being the highest viewed episode of the season, with 6.6 .6 million witnessing the story's conclusion. A figure this high was last achieved in 1985, and even though it was just for one episode, it's nice to see the numbers shoot higher for the program once again. For the top 40 TV programs, all episodes managed to stay within the top 100 except for part 3, which sadly dropped out and finished at 108th, the worst chart position for any episode that season. The remaining three episodes all vary, 
Part 2 coming close to dropping out, charting at 99th, Part 1 aims a little higher by finishing at 86th, and Part 4 unsurprisingly is the winner, managing to notch itself at 79th place. So we've seen Doctor Who slip out of the top 100 a handful of times during Season 25, but it still seems few and far between. But why are these viewing figures all over the place? Why did audiences sink so low before soaring to new heights for Season 25? What factors were at play here? Just to get it out of the way, because it's sadly become a fixture at this point, the competition over at ITV was still primarily Coronation Street, and with the Christmas season promising even more heightened drama down at the Rover's return, those already hooked weren't going to switch channel anytime soon. However, the fact that the greatest show in the galaxy went out over the Christmas and New Year period could have done Doctor Who some favours. By the late 80s, family viewing of Christmas time programming had become something of a staple amongst the British public. As a result, most programmes, particularly those airing in the evening slots, often received a boost in the ratings table. This could be the reason for why Part 4, which went out a few days into 1989, received the highest viewing figures of the Seventh Doctor's era thus far, with 6.6 .6 million tuning in. The numbers could have been higher if the promotional run continued its positive streak, however it seems that for Greatest Show in the Galaxy, the train slowed down dramatically. For the previous stories in Season 25, the leading actors, production members and figures with an association with the programme had been a constant fixture on various chat shows and children's programmes. However, no such interviews or appearances happened this time around, save for a short item on the BBC2 show, Behind the Screen, which showcased a short clip from Part 1. The TARDIS team did make pop-up appearances on some Christmas-themed programming, however. Sylvester appeared in costume as the Doctor for the Tomorrow's World Christmas Quiz that year, and later the Holiday Quiz, just before the New Year. Whereas Sophie Aldred appeared on Christmas Morning with Noel, which went out on Christmas Day 1988. The print world helped boost the serial a little better, with publications focusing on the guest appearance of popular actor and impressionist Jessica Martin, who was playing the werewolf Max. However, the most notable focus of some articles was the trouble production of the adventure itself. During routine maintenance, asbestos fibres were found in several studios of BBC Television Centre. The corporation closed all of its studios to rectify the issue, and producer John Nathan Turner was informed that The Greatest Show in the Galaxy could continue production as long as it found an alternative studio space. When this proved to be tricky to acquire, some last minute thinking was required. Given that the vast majority of the story took place within a circus tent, the team was able to put up a makeshift tent in the car park of BBC Elstree Studios. Even though this setup was quite primitive compared to the studios over at Television Centre, the production team were able to complete the remaining work, ensuring that the greatest show in the galaxy would see the light of day, and wouldn't meet the same fate as the cancelled Sharda, which failed to materialise as the season 17 finale back in early 1980. It's such a relief that this serial did make it to air, as it serves to be one of the most unique stories in the vast back catalogue of Doctor Who adventures. The circus setting feels familiar, yet extremely unnerving, whether it's the dingy look of the ring, the eerie presence of the troop of clowns, or the flamboyant characters the TARDIS team meet along the way. Standout performances certainly go to many of the supporting cast. T.P. McKenna is a joy as the self-congratulatory Captain Cook, Jessica Martin delivers a likeable and terrifying performance as Mags, and Ian Reddington delivers true shivers down the spine as the chief clown. With very little spoken dialogue, Reddington's interpretation focuses mainly on physical and facial expressions, which either leave you chuckling or leave you holding your breath in wicked anticipation. The central villains, the gods of Ragnarok, may not do a great deal overall, but have this air of power that works so well with who monsters like this. And it's a shame that we haven't seen them make some sort of return over the years. Greatest show marked the second script from Stephen Wyatt, who made his Who debut the previous year with Paradise Towers. Having been impressed with his work, he was asked to return, and this script both incorporates elements of Paradise Towers, whilst also feeling completely different and unique. It's an adventure that has always commanded a lot of praise and respect, whether from how it overcame the production troubles, or for the weird and wonderful directions it decides to take. The Greatest Show in the Galaxy serves as a fitting conclusion to a season brimming with imagination, wonderful concepts and characters, and a lead who undergoes some of the most extensive development in years. Grab your tickets, and come and join the Psychic Circus. Overall, this story attracted an average of 5.4 million viewers, a 0.1 drop from the previous story. So it's clear that the big boost in Part 4 couldn't bring the overall viewership above Silver Nemesis, or even above 6 million, but the fact that the drop is so minuscule for the season finale is reassuring at the very least. Similar to last year's viewing figures, whilst Doctor Who may have remained miles away from its former glories in the ratings charts, it was still attracting a fairly sizeable loyal following, one that would hopefully stick around for next year's run in 1989. The greatest show in the galaxy may not be for everyone, it certainly won't be for you if you have a fear or phobia of clowns, but still to this day, it showcases Doctor Who at its most creative. 
to take a script revolving around a strange circus, combined with production issues that almost got the serial axed, and to deliver four episodes of fun, imagination, and some really engaging concepts, that's what Doctor Who is all about. To come and watch the antics of the psychic circus for yourself, you can read the Target book from 1989, or its audio adaptation from 2013. To watch it, it made its way to VHS in the year 2000, and then on DVD via a standalone release from 2012. Lots of acrobatics, lots of strange characters, and even stranger clowns, this is what The Greatest Show in the Galaxy is all about. It may not have been scheduled to be the closing story of the season, but in many ways, it feels quite fitting that it wraps up this run of adventures. After the bombastic explosive events of Remembrance of the Daleks, to the eerie goings-on in The Happiness Patrol, and after the breath of fresh air that is Silver Nemesis, Greatest Show in many ways feels like a culmination of all of those elements, packaged together in that tried-and-true Doctor Who format. Definitely check it out for yourself, and I hope you manage to keep the gods of Ragnarok entertained. As I think has been said before, I wasn't after. Anyway, you ain't seen nothing yet. So that's season 25, the four stories that comprise it, and the ratings that they garnered. With the transmission of part four of The Greatest Show in the Galaxy, season 25 was brought to an end, concluding a three-month run comprised of 14 episodes across four stories. Now, let's have a look at the averages for this season. Similar to how season 24 played out, the numbers are very consistent for the most part, with there only being a 0.4 million gap between the most and least viewed episode of the season. The winner is the 25th anniversary story, Silver Nemesis, which had an average of 5.5 million tuning in across its three-week run. Given the hype and promotion dedicated to the story in celebration of the anniversary, the crowning achievement here hardly seems surprising, though it is a shame that it only won by 0.1 million against two other stories. The least viewed story was The Happiness Patrol, with 5.1 million on average. A shame, really, given the high quality of that story's writing, but on the plus side, if around the 5 million range is where Doctor Who is destined to stay in the final years of the 80s, at least it's managing to hit that target consistently. Though, like season 24, I feel these results represent where the programme was in the perceptions of the general viewing audience. Dedicated fans were always bound to tune in, but amongst the wider public, Doctor Who had sadly become somewhat of a joke in many eyes. A relic of a bygone era, a show that had lost its charm and former glory, and now represented cheap sci-fi that the BBC was unwilling to sink more money and time into. Now, as we always do, let's work out the overall average for this season. By combining the average ratings for each story, we can calculate that the average viewing figures for season 25 of Doctor Who stands at around roughly 5.4 million viewers. This is a 0.4 million increase from the season 24 average, which obviously is a marked improvement, but it hardly deserves much celebration as it continued to showcase the fact that Doctor Who wasn't hitting the heights it used to, despite all the changes and innovation going on behind the scenes. When placed alongside the previous 24 seasons, Season 25 charts as the third least viewed season of the program on our journey thus far. It ranks 0.4 million above Season 24 and 0.5 million above Season 23, which remains in last place. So, once again, we have a season that in its year of broadcast fell into the bottom five, a worrying trend that doesn't seem to be getting better. By the time of Season 25's conclusion, we can see that four of the five seasons that occupy these bottom slots are from the 1980s. A very unfortunate look at how the program's reputation and appeal amongst UK viewers rapidly diminished. Let's look at the Sylvester McCoy years so far. As mentioned, both seasons 24 and 25 rank as some of the least viewed Doctor Who seasons, at least in terms of the program's first 25 years on air. Things do seem to be improving with the slight increase we see with season 25, but as season 26 was being prepared, we can only hope that this upward trend continues, even if it is by another small margin. Season 25 not only had to turn around a lot of negative perceptions of the programme after the previous year, but had to package together four adventures that showcased Doctor Who at its best, right in time for its silver anniversary. In my opinion, they delivered in spades. Each story from season 25 feels wildly different, offers a lot for the audiences to engage with, and each have many memorable characters or moments that fans continue to cite as great examples of the programme to this day. Remembrance of the Daleks is often seen as the real 25th anniversary story, with its callbacks to the show's origins and the wonderful use of the Doctor's greatest enemies, pitting them against a rebellious faction of their own race, as well as one of the best supporting character lineups in all of Who. The Happiness Patrol can be overlooked, but I urge you to explore its dark and dingy caverns. The themes employed are a joy to witness, and the Candyman at the very least is a memorable villain. Silver Nemesis may feel like a dud in some respects, but it will make you smile and feel entertained, with the Cybermen appearing to bolster up the stakes. And finally, the greatest show in the galaxy brings it all together, delivering thrills, chills, and several fantastic scenes that highlight the supporting cast and the central TARDIS team, who, quite frankly, have excelled all year. 
the Doctor and Ace really get to develop their relationship, and this would only continue to see further detailed development the following year. But with season 26 penciled in, just where could the production team go now? What new stories could they come up with that retain the new darker edge of season 25, whilst also developing the relationship of the Doctor and Ace, and entertain audiences, and hopefully attracting new viewers? It's a big task to take on to say the least, but how did they do? You'll have to join me next time to find out. So those are the ratings details for Season 25. I hope you enjoyed this numerical look back at Doctor Who's Silver Anniversary Year, one brimming with imaginative stories, featuring enemies old and new, and really beginning to push for a darker and more mysterious characterization of the title role. If you want to watch more Doctor Who content, then I highly recommend that you check out Kane Unable. Aladu makes some of the funniest Doctor Who edits I've ever seen. His poorly animated Who videos are a particular highlight, though I will warn you, they aren't for the faint of heart. But check out his channel and subscribe to him whilst you're at it. If you want to read more about Doctor Who in the making of it, then I highly recommend the Complete History series of books, which I used as reference for this video. If you want to keep up to date with this series, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and if you want to see new episodes of the series early, then you can, by supporting us on Patreon or via my Ko-fi page. Please consider leaving a like, subscribing to the channel, and leaving your thoughts on Season 25 in the comments section below. I've been Adam Martin from AMTV, and we'll see you next time for Season 26.